welcome ladies i'm so happy to see people joining um we're gonna go ahead and get started um so i'm lorraine Feindrick, and i am so happy to have here with me today stephanie prendergast uh, to talk about physical therapy for pelvic health and pain relief uh, so welcome stephanie thanks for having me yeah um, my pleasure so uh, for, for those of you who don't know me, I am a pelvic health and pain relief coach and I specialize in helping women integrate mind-body approaches into relieving their pelvic pain. Um, and Stephanie and I have known each other for about eight years now, mm -hmm. yeah? And she's been a very valued and appreciated guest many, many times in my Healing Female Pain program. Um, and so I'm really excited today to dive a little more into pelvic health with her, in addition to pelvic pain relief. So um, let me tell you a little more about Stephanie. So Stephanie Prendergast, MPT, is co-founder of the Pelvic Health and Rehabilitation Center, which opened in San Francisco in 2006. Since then, she and Liz can you say her last name for me? Liz Akunjalar. <laughs> Akunjalar have grown, thank you, PHRC to nine additional locations to be the largest multicenter clinic in the United States dedicated to management of pelvic floor disorders. Stephanie and Liz have developed continuing education courses on the topics of pedendal neuralgia and advanced management of pelvic pain syndromes. Stephanie was the first physical therapist to serve as the president of the International Pelvic Pain Society and has authored numerous publications in peer reviewed journals and textbooks and regularly lectures at medical conferences. She is an advocate for people with pelvic floor dysfunction, pelvic floor physical therapists, and the field of pelvic health. Stephanie and Liz co authored the popular book Pelvic Pain Explained and PHRC publishes an award-winning blog as the pelvis turns. And uh, I feel very lucky and excited to have her here to talk with us about pelvic health today. So welcome again. Thank you. Yeah. So we're gonna, um, what we'll do today is Stephanie and I are gonna just chat for about 30 minutes about physical therapy for pelvic health and pain relief. Um, and then we are going to open it up and Stephanie's going to answer your questions. So as we go, you can use the Q&A box that you see um, on your screen to type in questions, send questions in now or later when we get to the Q&A time. So um, to start with Stephanie, how about if you just tell us a little bit about what pelvic floor physical therapy is? Yeah, it's a great time to have this lecture. Um, Tuesday was World Physical Therapy Day, so we're celebrating. Oh, wow. <laughs> so pelvic floor physical therapists are physical therapists that have been through PT school. Um, but still today in 2020, pelvic floor education is not part of the regular physical therapy curriculum in almost all of the physical therapy schools. So for your pelvic floor physical therapist to be able to work with this demographic, they need to take advanced training afterwards. So they can take courses such as ours, go through training programs like the one we offer, or they need to go through another advanced formal training program. Yeah. So, I mean, that brings up the question for me. Do you have any, do you guys have a resource uh, there or a way you can recommend women who want to see a pelvic floor physical therapist? who don't have access to one of your locations um, can find someone that has that training? Yes, so there are actually a few great organizations now um, that have directories for people to find physical therapists. And compared to when I started 20 years ago, there's so many more of us now. And if you want, we could put those in the notes that yeah, go yeah. out in the email with great. the links for people. Yes. Yeah. Yes, so yes, that'd be fantastic. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about what, a pel what pelvic floor physical therapists do. So what is the pelvic floor? What is a healthy pelvic floor? Um, how do, what are the pelvic floor muscles? Mm -hmm. 
So most people don't know that we even really have a pelvic floor or what it is until something starts to go wrong, as we know. Um, So these are an interesting group of muscles that run from the pubic bone to the tailbone, and they are responsible for supporting our pelvic organs, such as the bladder, the uterus, the rectum. Um, But they also are involved in urinary and bowel function and responsible for things like erection in men and orgasm in both sexes. Now, these muscles are different than any other muscle in the body because they also have what's called autonomic function, which means that they kind of operate on their own without us thinking about it, and they are always active and they never, ever rest. Other muscles in the body don't have that component because they're not involved in reflexes, and people don't realize this, but to actually go to the bathroom and just urinate, there's 18 different spinal reflexes involved. And so a lot of times the pelvic floor is actively, for example, keeping us continent until the moment our brain says, okay, it's time to go. So while the muscles kind of do their own thing, we also have the ability to override them, which really makes pelvic floor physical therapy a dynamic process between us as the PTs and our patients. So we basically will teach people how to control their muscles at the most basic sense of pelvic floor PT when things start to go awry. Um, In addition to having the pelvic floor anatomy and function knowledge, we are still physical therapists. And so even though we're called pelvic floor PTs, a lot of the problems that people present with that involve the pelvic floor also involve other parts of the body. And so we really wanna address everything, at least from the waist down. And as I know we're gonna talk about, and the neck up, with the mind-body connection and the role that that can play. Right, yeah. I mean, one of the reasons I um, am so appreciative of your work and pelvic health and rehab in general is because of what an integrative approach you take. And also, I I meant to say this earlier, but I just feel like you guys are the go-to people for up-to-date information and research in a field that's really changing and advancing quickly. Yeah. Oh, thank you. We try to stay on top of it. And the advantage of having a company this size is everybody has their own individual interests and brings it all together for our educational presentations and staff meetings. So we try to stay on top of things because it is changing quick, which is great because there's room for improvement. (laughs) And that group approach definitely probably helps. It does. So, um, so So that's a little bit about what the pelvic floor is. And I know that one diagnosis that on its own is a thing, but also can be underlying pelvic health issues is pelvic floor dysfunction. So can you say a little bit about what that is um, and maybe how it can impact pelvic health in women? So we just talked about the whole list of things that the pelvic floor does. And so when it becomes dysfunctional, and that can mean that the muscles are weak, it can mean that the muscles are tight, or it can mean that we've lost our ability to control the muscles and for them to function on their own. So there can be a mixture of tightness and weakness. Um, People will start to develop symptoms. That can be as benign as a little bit of urinary urgency frequency, or as severe as unprovoked pain anywhere in the genitals, burning with urination, difficulty with bowel movement, painful sex, There's a whole gamut of things, unfortunately, because of how important these muscles are. Um, And if we want to take the spectrum of it, there are certain clusters of diagnoses that tend to go with the tight muscles, and then certain things that you may see with the weak muscles, and then certain milestones in a woman's life where the pelvic floor muscles are going to become compromised. Um, Should I go through that a little bit? Yeah, go ahead. Go right into that. Yeah. Okay. So on the tighter end of things, I mean, we really start looking at Pelvic floor dysfunction can happen in in children, and that manifests as bedwetting and constipation. People who have had bedwetting and constipation challenges as children are more likely to have adult pelvic floor disorders. And women, more than men, have more things going on in our pelvis, as we all know, starting with our periods. And when the period starts, women may start to have pain and have symptoms characteristic of endometriosis, which are painful periods. Uh, Studies now show that 95% of women who have endometriosis also have pelvic floor disorders because it's an ongoing pain situation that can happen every month. Women are often given birth control pills when they start their period, either to reduce the flow or to reduce the pain. 
we now know that that's associated with vulvar disorders and vulvar pain, which also comes with pelvic floor dysfunction. So starting as early as our first periods, women may start to have some pelvic floor issues that could be developing. In the female athlete population, we see a different type of pelvic floor disorder, which could manifest as stress incontinence, which we normally think of in adults and people later in life, but that can happen in teenage years in our intense athletes. Then we start to get into our 20s and maybe people are having babies. That is a complete pelvic floor compromise, both with the pregnancy and a C-section or vaginal delivery that really needs to be rehabbed. And it's only been since 2018 that OBGYNs are really acknowledging that women do need to have rehab after having a baby. So at least it's happening, but I feel like we're a little late to the game. Yes. Yeah. And that, right? You, and then as we continue. <clears throat> Sorry, go ahead. You said something uh, recently that was about, I think just those, those issues that start postpartum can go on for a long time, right? If they're not addressed. Yes. I'm so happy to see the phrase circulating right now, postpartum is forever. Right, that's what you said, yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I think a lot of, it's excellent, with the rise of pelvic floor PT, they're getting pregnant, they're having babies, and it's some people's focus, while mine is more on pelvic pain, to really raise awareness about what happens with the pelvic floor during labor and delivery. And at any point from that point on, there could be pelvic floor compromise that can benefit from getting an evaluation with the pelvic floor PT. Yeah. As we get into perimenopause and menopause, we will start to have age-related changes to the pelvic floor that on top of some compromise that may still be existing from delivery or perhaps from some of these other pain disorders that I've mentioned, such as endometriosis, IC, vulvodynia, we start to see other issues that pop up. So there may still be some pain issues, but now we may see things like stress incontinence, difficulty with bowel movement, absent or diminished orgasm, painful sex, and pelvic organ prolapse, which the number one risk factor for pelvic organ prolapse is a vaginal delivery. And so if we were to better take care of women after they deliver their babies, we wouldn't be seeing as much pelvic organ prolapse as people start to enter perimenopause and menopause. A lot of these things can be addressed without a lot of effort. So that's the good news. Yes. It sounds like yeah. I'm saying all these problems. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. So maybe we can jump a little more into that. Like, what are some earlier signs? Because even I know working with women who have pelvic pain issues, it's like, oh, these patterns have been going on a long time. The, obviously the bio, like the neuromuscular ones, but also the emotional ones. But so when people start, you know, what are some signs that a, somebody should maybe go for a pelvic health evaluation with a physical therapist? That's a great question because a lot of times there can be underlying dysfunction without symptoms enough that send off the alarm bells to tell you to go to the doctor. And that can be something as simple as some basic urinary urgency and frequency. If you're urinating more than six to eight times in a 24 hour period, that's usually a sign that something is off and wrong, but maybe that doesn't bother you. So you don't think to talk to your doctor about it. Or if you do talk to your doctor about it and they're not someone who's a pelvic health expert, they may just tell you to drink less water, which is really not the way to approach that. Um, other symptoms may be some discomfort with intercourse. There should never be pain with intercourse. If there is, there's something wrong. And sometimes, again, people think, oh, it's not bad enough for me to do anything about it. And their doctor may say something like, drink a glass of wine. If right. we were to do our exam, which I think we're going to talk about a little later about how women can check themselves, um, we just want to know how we're functioning and just know that there's different, this is an entire area of expertise that the regular urologist, gynecologist, or PCP just may not have been exposed to. But if your body is giving you some warning signs, there may be something that you can do to improve your pelvic floor health. Right. So frequency, discomfort during intercourse. Um, and then you mentioned, bowel, it, obviously, oh, bowel movements. Bowel movements. So you shouldn't be in the bathroom for more than 10 minutes and that's on the upper end of things. So pelvic floor dysfunction can also manifest as difficulty with bowel movements, 
people feel like they can't fully empty. Mm -hmm. They may feel like um, it's just very difficult to do that. Yeah. And then also, I think you mentioned once even younger, right? So like, uh, I think when girls have period pain, uh, they're going for, maybe they're going on the pill because they don't want to deal with having their period, or they maybe would even look at nutritional things, but that can that also be like a pelvic floor issue or a time to get an evaluation? Yes. So painful periods, again, are often caused by things like endometriosis. But we have in our bodies what's called the viscerosomatic reflex. And viscero just means organ. And in this case, it could be the uterus or the endometriosis implant. Somatic just means muscle and tissue. And so as someone goes through a visceral pain state every month, there's going to be somatic consequences. And there's going to be consequences on the nervous system. And so what research has really shown only in the last five or six years is that so many of these patients do have pelvic floor issues and all of these women, in addition to their medical treatment, should undergo pelvic floor physical therapy. It can be tricky with endometriosis because currently the only way to diagnose it is with a laparoscopic surgery, which most people, of course, are not excited about. And therefore they go on hormonal suppressive therapies which come from a whole, it causes a whole other host of issues, which is basically putting teenagers and people in their 20s in a menopausal state to suppress the endometriosis, but then that causes other problems with both the pelvic floor and the vulva. Right. Hormones. Yeah. Hormones. <laughs> yeah. Hormones and muscles. <laughs> yeah. I almost feel like, like a pelvic floor evaluation, like pelvic health evaluation should be part of regular care before, you know, postpartum. Um, just, yeah. So you also mentioned um, athletes. And so, and like prolapse and um, frequency. And I know that a lot of women, when they hear that are thinking Kegels, right? Like that when people, when women are educated about their pelvic floor at all, it's like do Kegels to strengthen your pelvic floor. So I'm wondering if you could share your thoughts on that and maybe some other approaches to maintaining pelvic floor strength um, that might be healthier. Yeah. And I think education has improved in this area too, where, I mean, even teenage magazines back when I was growing up, Kegel, 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 it's going to improve your orgasm. I mean, most teenagers and people in their early 20s, people who have not given birth, most people do not have pelvic floor weakness because of those muscles always being active, as I already mentioned. And so Kegeling and Kegeling with weights and things like that could actually push you into a pain state that would have to be undone by a professional. And so we really wanna be mindful that these muscles under normal everyday life are functioning with our core. And we don't usually need to do additional strengthening unless there's been some sort of compromise. Mm -hmm. And as we talked briefly on, when there is a pain disorder, we're usually trying to lengthen the muscles and do a reverse Kegel. And as we get into later decades where there is true weakness, that's when we actually want to have the muscles, not just the pelvic floor, work with the whole body. And so to simply say kegeling is kind of eliminating, it's like calling this an airplane when really it's a space shuttle. So it's really just an oversimplification of what our bodies really need to be taught to do. Right. So it's not just about contracting to strengthen, right? It's like about flexibility and being also being able to relax. Um, the muscles to build strength. Yeah. Yes. And Enjoy. just that like the pelvic girdle and the core too, this involves our abdominal muscles and involves our gluteal muscles. And it's also about how everything works together, not just the contraction and isolation. So what are some other kinds of pain that may not even be pelvic floor related that could indicate that there could be some pelvic floor issues or that could be impacting the pelvic floor? Uh, our um, colleagues in Canada just did a fantastic large number study where they looked at people with complaints of back pain, um, any type of back pain. And what's really interesting about their study is that they also screened these people who were only complaining of back pain for symptoms of pelvic floor dysfunction. 
and then put all of these people through a pelvic floor exam and found that in over 87% of the people, there was either pelvic floor pain, there was pelvic floor weakness, and they all had pelvic, the 87% did have some type of pelvic floor dysfunction. And so if you think about how separate pelvic floor PTs are from regular physical therapy, you're going to regular physical therapy for back pain, for hip pain, and this isn't being incorporated into your treatment plan, this may be one of the reasons why those plans aren't always successful. Right. But a pelvic floor physical therapist would be able to address all of those areas because they have training in both, right? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And that's like an important piece of back pain and hip pain and knee pain and all that other stuff. So yeah, great. And the Um, fact that women have these pain issues at such a higher prevalence than men, you know, what's the, what's the difference? hormones, and pregnancy. So we really need to be proactive about our health after we make it through all the family raising and whatnot. Like we want right. to be able to enjoy yeah. our lives comfortably. Going there, but I think emotionally there can be a difference, you know, in how women have learned to relate to their bodies, especially sexuality, if there's been any emotional or sexual trauma, like all of that can literally impact the muscles and create tension. It can impact the nervous system. So yeah Uh, yeah not that men don't have pelvic floor issues but so obviously women are using their bodies differently and more than men (laughs) but i think also there can be some mind body pieces absolutely so um let's see here uh can let maybe we could talk about pelvic pain a little bit more and how pelvic floor dysfunction or imbalance in the pelvic floor can cause different kinds of pelvic pain, whether that's pain during sex, um, vulvodynia, vulvar pain, interstitial cystitis. Mm-hmm. I have a little model here. Can we use that? Absolutely. That would be great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Yay. You brought All it. Right. This is from one of our colleagues um, in Canada again, and we can put her reference in the notes too. But okay. if this is looking at the pelvis from the outside as if you're like lying on your back at a GYN table. And here you can see our vagina and the rectum. That's what these two are. But uh-huh. so superficially, we have these muscles here that are the urogenital triangle that surround the urethra. And so you can see how close the relationship is between the opening of the vagina, the rectum, and the urethra. If these muscles start to become too tight and compress things, they're gonna make you feel like you need to urinate when you don't. They're gonna make intercourse hurt. And then you're gonna have trouble relaxing your sphincter to have a bowel movement. But if you look on the inside, so this is like the oh, top so looking cool. down, <laughs> and you can see what a pelvic floor physical therapist does with the holes that she's created. So then you've got all the muscles that go from the pubic bone back to the tailbone on the, both sides. And so as a pelvic floor PT, we're inside palpating these muscles. We're looking to see if they're tight, if they hurt and if they can do what we ask them to. So with our finger inside, we can ask people to squeeze their pelvic floor muscles and relax. We can see how quickly they squeeze, how long it takes them to relax. And basically, if it's not working the way we think it should, we can usually also feel where the problems are that also match up with A, what our patients are telling us symptom-wise, and then the objective Mm -hmm. findings in here. And again, because these muscles surround so many important structures, they can just cause pain and dysfunction in all of them, which is really scary, but it doesn't need to be. It's just anatomy. Yeah. We can fix it. Right. (laughs) It's like most people don't even know that that's there. Right. (laughs) And and also, like, I'm sure you must work with this too, but like, even like, I find so many women are just completely kind of cut off, dissociated from what's happening in that part of their body. And so... There, can, there is like probably some re-education about learning to connect with those muscles and how to use them properly with the exercise. If, if there's been pain, if there's been trauma, it is in a, it's a known thing with pain that your, it's called your proprioception, which is your ability to move your own body, is completely altered because your neural programming is off. And that can also be the case with traumatic life events. 
And so we really understand how people got to that point better than the person who's with us probably does. So we can help them better understand how some of these things have happened. I mean, because why would you know, as we said earlier in this um, interview, but it's yes. really important to help people reconnect with their bodies and learn how to move again, and then right. things will get better. Yeah, that, that's actually yeah. one of the things I think, I mean, beyond all the other amazing information you have, just simply helping people reconnect with a part of their body that they might not be connected with and having somebody who like is comfortable with that and does that all day long and um, you know, when you were just showing that wonderful model, I'm thinking some women might be thinking, oh my gosh, like <laughs> that looks like kind of a scary appointment to go to. So can you say anything about that? How you help women feel comfortable or, you know, go for a pelvic floor evaluation? It can be scary, especially if you've been in pain or you think these things are embarrassing, which can happen. Um, we, especially at our company, try to make everybody feel comfortable from the moment they call. Our administrative team is amazing. They're in our staff meetings with us, so they could probably do this interview for me. <laughs> but I think once people hear that we're asking questions that they can relate to based on their symptoms and not something that seems abstract, hopefully that makes everybody feel a little bit more comfortable. And we just want to explain that this is, this is something that affects one in between three and four women at multiple points in her lifetime. And so this is not uncommon, even though people may not wanna talk about it. So when we do the exam, A, just I hope people feel sure that they're in the hands of somebody who knows how to examine and are sensitive to the fact that things have been painful. We'll start by just a very basic conversation where they can tell us what they want to about their symptoms. Um, we do that with everybody clothed and dressed. And then following the history taking, we'll go through the external portion of the exam. We'll leave the room. We'll allow people to change. Um, and it depends on what they have going on. Some people have more of a biomechanical basis to the pain where we need to do more movement-based things. And sometimes people maybe have vulvodynia because they had 10 infections. That's probably not going to be as important for me to look at their lumbar spine compared to somebody that may have back pain and pelvic pain. And so we'll kind of gauge the initial evaluation based on what our patients have told us. And then at the end of that hour, we're, we have the objective findings, we have their history, and we put together what's called an assessment, which is how do we think they got this problem? And then what are we gonna do short-term and long-term to change it? Physical therapy usually happens over the course of, in pain conditions, we'll say at least 12 weeks, probably once a week where we want to see what we're going to accomplish week one through three and make a little short-term goal, which could be by the end of week three, Mary's going to be able to voluntarily relax her pelvic floor, which is going to allow her to urinate without hesitancy. And then longer-term goal would be Mary doesn't urinate more than six to eight times in a 24-hour period. Mary can engage in pleasurable intercourse. You know, so we try to keep it in small little increments and then week to week we watch things change over time. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm going to ask one more question and then I'm going to, Stephanie can take questions from all of you on the call. So if anybody has any questions, if you see there's a little box that says Q&A and if you click on that, it'll open up and you can type your questions in. Um, and then uh, either Stephanie will read them or I'll read them to her and she'll be able to answer those. So um, before we move on to that, I have several more questions, but I'll give other people a chance. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we'll go to like, what's one thing you would recommend for women to help keep their pelvic floor healthy? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I do think that if any of the little symptoms showed up that we talked about, it's worth it to get an evaluation with a pelvic floor physical therapist. Um, one thing we didn't get to yet that we've been encouraging more so lately is to have women do a self-assessment, both of their vulva, so they know what their skin looks like, they know what the area around the clitoris looks like, where the urethra is, and to check in and see if they can contract and relax their pelvic floor muscles. So both things are easy to do. One of my newer employees just introduced us to this little device. Ooh, I've never which, seen one of those. 
you can buy this on Amazon. It has a light and it extends and it is a diabetic foot checker. So for people with diabetes, they need to make sure they're not getting ulcers on their feet. This also is a wonderful tool to help women actually see their vulva. So wonderful. we just put a video on our YouTube channel about how to look at your vulva. It's easier to do with the video that we created versus showing now, but you can get this on Amazon for $6 and then you can assess what your tissues look like each. I recommend doing it almost like a breast exam every quarter, every month. People should really get an idea to familiarize themselves with their anatomy because when things start to change, we can usually see it. Our patients can feel it. We can feel it. And early detection is the key to getting on the right path. While you're down there with the mirror, you can try to contract your pelvic floor. You can try to relax your pelvic floor. You can see your muscles move in the mirror if you can't feel them yourself. And if you can't feel your muscles moving, that may be an indication that you might need some help to get that going again with one of us. Yeah, I love it. That's wonderful. And I <laughs> yeah, I wholeheartedly support self-examination. Uh, so maybe in the follow-up email, if you want to send me a link to that light, that little mirror, and also your video on YouTube, I'd be sure. happy to share that too. Yeah. So let me see. We had a question come in, two questions come in. So the first one is, do you think you can heal vaginismus without doing physical exercises or using wands? A great question. Um, so vaginismus, just for everyone to know, is a state of involuntary pelvic floor muscle tightening. And the involuntary is the key word here. It is associated with entryway blockage with sex and inability to have sex. And once a woman maybe tries the first time, there may also be what's called guarding on top of that, which is voluntary contraction on top of something that's already very tight. And so because it's involuntary, the muscles usually have shortened to a place that without external assistance, it may be difficult to get them to come back down to normal resting tone, especially for people who have what's called primary vaginismus, which means that it's been present basically since birth, compared to secondary vaginismus, which delivers after a period or develops after a period of having a normal pelvic floor. Um, the wand is one way to do it. Pelvic floor physical therapy is another way. Dilators are really helpful for this patient population. I'd say more than the wand, especially the expandable dilators, to really help stretch the pelvic floor because these are circular muscles. And so if we it's stretched this way, it's going to help lengthen things versus with the wand, you can get individual stretching in some of the muscles, but you're not gonna get the same expansion that you're gonna get with some of the, the newer dilators that are out. Um, I am sure, because I believe most people can overcome anything they set their mind to, people may be able to do non-physical exercises to relax the muscles, but it's hard for me to imagine that because I just see them in such a involuntary contracted state that we normally need to assist. Yes. So I will also add um, that I see a huge impact on, vagin on vaginismus with women I work with from using mind-body work. And I yeah. think that the mind-body work can work really well in conjunction with dilators or wands or other things that you might use for insertion. Um, both but both like, like working with the emotions um, and think thoughts and anything that's creating stress or tension, probably involuntarily, maybe also some voluntary contraction around the vagina in the pelvic floor. Um, but also while using those things, like learning how to work with your body more, breathe more. I mean, I'm sure you also teach that. Um, but, but there's a little fun fact about that. Can I share yeah, that with you? Yeah, absolutely. So I am a, I'm a paid consultant for Materna Medical who makes the Millie, the expandable dilator. And we recently just studied the behaviors of 235 women using Millie. And the people who had the most benefit were those who chose to meditate and do mindfulness while using the Millie compared to some people who were watching TV 
compared to some people who were just reading. And it was really the activity of exactly what you're saying made a noticeable difference in the amount of progress that these women had. Yeah. But so I thought that was very thank cool. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And I will <laughs> yes. also go out on a limb here and say my hunch is, or at least what I see with women I work with, is that there can also be something about their relationship with pleasure. So I think there's kind of this weird disconnection, right? You, you're like working with people on an intimate part of their body and it's like medical treatment, right? But yeah. also it's a part of your body that has lots of nerve endings that were meant for pleasure. And like, like just learning how to use things in a way that feels good instead of is like dissociated and tuned out and in front of the TV. Um, working on your relationship with allowing pleasure into what you're doing to help heal can also especially when there's been pain in a place where right. there shouldn't be right. i mean it's so important to stop becoming the patient and become the person again and that is difficult when you're undergoing all the treatments that we have to do and that's why i always think your program has been helpful to help people get back to themselves and that side of things too they can't just be physical therapy in a box in isolation. It's just not going to work when this is such an integrated problem. Yeah. And it's also really great to work hands-on with a physical therapist who like understands that integrative approach and like all the different things that are impacting the muscles and the nerves and the pelvic floor. So yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right, next question. Um, can interstitial cystitis be a misdiagnosis? if related to pelvic floor dysfunction or are symptoms related to the pelvic floor? That is a great question. And it's a really hot topic right now. September is also interstitial cystitis awareness month. So wow. if people are on social media, <laughs> I know what's going on. Uh, they may see a lot of things out there that are happening. And I am on okay, interstitial cystitis is a misnomer because the, Knowledge of the syndrome has changed, but the name has not. And the name initially applied that there was something wrong with the bladder itself, and specifically the bladder lining. But what we now know is that in the majority of cases, less than 10% of people actually have a problem with the bladder lining, even though they're in a lot of pain and they have irritated bladder symptoms. So the bladder is better known now with all the research that has gone into this to be more of the victim than the cause. And in unsurprising news, because this is a visceral pain syndrome, almost everybody has pelvic floor dysfunction and central sensitization. So in that regard, it's not that different. Well, it is different than endometriosis because endometriosis has a visceral disease and all the rest of this. In interstitial cystitis, there's often not an infection people who really don't feel well, very irritated, angry bladders, have pristine looking bladders on cystoscopy. So the AUA, American Urologic Association, no longer recommends cystoscopy to do a diagnosis. And it's just a clinical diagnosis now. And pelvic floor physical therapy is the first line thing in addition to medications like amitriptyline and meditation and mindfulness. Yeah. So that is actually in a medical guideline now. Wow. And so again, I, it's amazing. <laughs> and that's not new. It's been there since 2011. Oh. It was revised in 2014. But I still think that my observation is the regular medical community still thinks of this as a bladder disease, unless they're really a specialist, which can be so confusing for patients. So right. uh, yes, I do. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you. And also like that's such important information for women to have. And I, I just want to expand from like, you know, interstitial cystitis, uh, like focusing more on the muscles and then incorporating meditation and physical therapy. At, just like to talk a little bit about pain in general and that, you know, the connection, like things that can in, cause pain beyond just what's happening physically in the body. Um, and maybe you mentioned central sensitization. So for anybody on the call who isn't familiar with that, can you want to say a little more about pain science, pain? Yeah. Yeah. Because this is so important. And it's been really cool to see that mindfulness and these mind-body therapies are now researched to have, they definitely have a positive influence on pelvic pain specifically. 
And the reason is, is pelvic pain is something that occurs for longer than three months. And anytime there is a pain syndrome that persists like this, there's going to be changes in your nervous system. And it's like, it's more receptive to feeling pain. And I'm, I don't love the word central sensitization anymore because it implies that, you know, it's just this broken nervous system, but there, and it's not because it's really, it, it is very changeable with right. our thoughts and our beliefs. And this is again, something that's now commonplace where I think when you and I started talking, it still seems so woo woo. And this is yes. just not true. <laughs> so it's helpful because this is things people can do at home to help themselves. It doesn't involve any medical procedures. And because the pelvic floor has these autonomic properties, it's got innervation that is directly influenced by our emotions, good and bad. And we've got to get the good to stick and the bad to start to dissipate. And people can completely do that on their own with help of people like yourself. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and it, it's yeah. such a big mindset really for anybody who, first of all, a lot of women who are having pelvic pain, it's just, it takes them a long time to even find a medical specialist who has good information. Um, so that's gonna create a lot of stress and disconnection and just focus on pain and trying to fix the body. And so that's gonna sensitize anybody's nervous system in my opinion, <laughs> you know, like uh, even of if there were patterns before that. So learning how to start switching your focus to safe, creating safety, breath, meditation, working with somebody who like has confidence and knows what's going on, learning how to bring your focus to pleasure. There's, yeah, it's, there's so many things women can do and men, but you know, I'm working with women mm -hmm. mostly. So to start healing. So yeah. 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 Um, okay. Um, one other question here was I missed the first half hour. Where can I see it? So we will send out an email uh, tomorrow with the link to the recording and also all of Stephanie's links for where to find more information online about what she mentioned in the call and also her practice and her office. Um, so we still have time. I have a few more questions I can ask Stephanie, but if anybody else here wants to ask anything, please feel free to um, go ahead and type your questions into that little box that says Q&A on the website. Um, and let me just update this. Okay. So, sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to, there we go. Okay. Um, so maybe uh, one thing I think would be great to talk about is how you're working with patients right now. I know you've added some virtual uh, telehealth visits, but also yes. are open in person. Yes. So we have, we are open at reduced capacity and following the CDC guidelines. And some people don't feel comfortable leaving their homes or maybe they've wanted to talk with us for a while and weren't able to. So we were happy to launch our digital platform in March and we've been talking to people from around the world. So whether it is related to pregnancy, postpartum, any type of pelvic pain, um, a number of our senior staff has made themselves available for these digital appointments where people can sign up on our website. We also have yoga and Pilates um, instructors in our pelvic floor PT population. And so they've also made themselves available if people feel like they want to exercise again and are a little unsure about how to make that transition. Um, and also on our staff is a pelvic floor PT who has completed her integrative health and nutrition degree. So she's also available online offering hormone testing and functional GI testing and dietary plans. So as a group, we've really just tried to make ourselves available and it's been wonderful to talk to so many different people, yeah. literally around the world, yeah. um, which has also led us to realize that there is still a lot of misinformation. Yes. Anybody who's been dealing with this knows there's like pockets of people who know a ton of information and then general confusion. Yeah. And so we're also working on various modules for patients who done on neuralgia, vestibulodynia, endometriosis are the first three where we found ourselves repeating ourselves on digital health. So making something less 
um, costly because it will be a video module, but is laying out all the basics that people tend to keep asking us, will be available starting in the fall through our website. Wonderful. So I just want to say, I think it's a really amazing resource that people who are not local to one of your offices, which I don't think I mentioned yet, are in California, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire. Um, and I, all the info was in yesterday's email, but will also go out in the follow-up email. Um, but just to be able to, you know, because there, because it's a field where there's so much variation in what practitioners know, um, to even be able to do a consultation with somebody who um, has the most up-to-date information uh, can be really helpful. And also I'm wondering, I know you mentor physical therapists as well, right? Mm -hmm. So those courses you mentioned are for patients, right? Mm -hmm. Do you offer anything for PTs as well? Yes, so with the launch of our digital platform, we are also offering one-on-one -on -one mentoring. That is specifically with me and Liz. Um, so if PTs need a little bit more individualized attention, that's available. Um, we also are putting our courses online. So starting in 2021, our Advanced Management of Pelvic Pain course will be available for CEUs. And Jandra Mueller and Britt Gross also have developed what appears to be the first in-depth course on endometriosis wow. with endometriosis surgeons and integrative health providers. And that is going to be in January. Um, so if medical professionals are interested in either of these courses, they can also sign up for that online and now don't have to go through the travel expense of hotels and, you know, airplane flights and things like that. Are those courses for physical therapists who already are pelvic floor physical therapists, like who already have the additional training, but to get Thanks. more, yeah, go more in depth. Thank you for asking that question. Yes. yes. So these are more advanced level classes because we don't have the hands-on lab component that pelvic floor PTs go through when they're first learning. So by the time you're getting into the courses that Jandra Britt and me and Liz are teaching, you should already be in the clinic, but just have the questions about, oh, well, this I'm just not sure what to do at this turn. And it's a lot of didactic information to help people better troubleshoot when treatment plans go stagnant, to help them better understand the medical side of things and just really tighten up their assessment and long-term planning. Okay, great. And this would be something that, you know, patients could even let their uh, physical therapists know about. Um, <laughs> yeah, if they yeah. felt like there was something that they wanted them to know. So, and that's happened too. We've had patients bring their PTs to their digital appointments, which has been really cool. And so then we can all work together on that person's treatment plan. And it's been yeah. really fun to be able to do that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, we had a couple more questions come in. One is, can pelvic floor issues be cured with PT over a period of time, or does it require lifelong maintenance of symptoms? This question comes up a lot, because um, people wonder, like, how long is this going to take, and is this going to come back? And I would say in general, once people have the tools that they need to treat the issue, people can get to 100%, but if there's another infection or if something happens to re-trigger some of the movement impairment, symptoms can also recur. And usually it's less scary and people know what to do, where to go, what they can do on their own. And it's also medically complicated. So it's not just a pelvic floor issue in the majority of cases. And so we also want to make sure, especially as pelvic floor PTs, that the medical side of our patient's needs are also being met. And sometimes it may look too much like PT and, and the medical side isn't involved enough. So sometimes people do need management depending on the situation. And sometimes it never bothers somebody again. And then the majority of people fall in the middle. So they're going to do okay for a period of time. There may be a little hiccup. Back to okay again. Yeah. And I would, I mean, I would just love to bring up and hear your thoughts on, I know that I've had several clients who have gone for an evaluation and said, my physical therapist says everything's fine, but I'm still having pain. So sometimes what might seem like pelvic floor issues are, is pain that needs to be 
addressed in other ways, like from, mm -hmm. from one of those ways could be a mind body approach um, to, to work on all the nervous system components and the emotional and mental components of pain in addition mm -hmm. to, to the muscular. So, yeah. Yep, because that muscular part is only one part of this. It, it's just one piece. So we do need to keep all these things in mind. Yeah. Um, but absolutely great to work with someone to make sure the physical stuff is all healed. Um, and then if there's ongoing issues, looking at other things that could be going on medically as well as mind body. So uh, another question here is I took the Healing Female Pain course a few years ago. And I remember that one of the rules was not to do anything that hurts the yoni. Yoni is like a word for vulva, vagina, all the female anatomy together. Um, but what do you do when physical palpation or self-massage hurts? Is it okay to feel some pain when, for example, using a dilator? Or is this doing the pain worse? I'm afraid of making the pain worse. Um, so I can, I can give some mind-body thoughts on that, but I'd love to first hear your thoughts, Stephanie. Um, yeah, um, that's a great question. Very good question. And some of the manual therapy when people are going through physical therapy, it may hurt, but it should be a therapeutic pain, like as if you're getting a massage on a slightly sore muscle, not a five alarm fire. And if it's causing extreme pain, or even pain that's different than therapeutic discomfort, manual therapy may not be appropriate at that point in time. And the same thing goes with dilators. I get nervous about them, even though obviously I'm an advocate for them. But sometimes if dilators are, people purchase them online, they've never seen a medical professional, we don't know if there's fulvar compromise, we don't know if there's nerve compromise, they may actually not be therapeutic. And again, it may not be the right time or place for them. And so it really needs to be addressed with somebody who knows how to use them and when to use them properly. And right now these are commercially available devices. And the same thing with some of the Kegel devices is some people really shouldn't be using these, but when these products are commercially available, combined with a lack of information in the general public and medical field, you can see the dilemma that people encounter. So I would direct people back to listening to their body. A general rule of thumb is if they start to do a therapeutic exercise or use a dilator and the pain is increasing, you may not be desensitizing, you may actually be sensitizing. Um, if you insert a dilator, and I'll let you take it from here, and then you're able to breathe through it and reduce the sensation of pain, then it's probably therapeutic yeah. to speak to that. Yeah, that's a good guideline. Um, and I appreciate hearing your thoughts on it. So I, and I would just say like that, like having the fallback be listening to your body, I just, in my experience, so many of us women, men too, have been kind of taught to turn over their care to somebody else and what someone else says to do. And part of the problem from a mind-body perspective is that we get disconnected from our body signals and we don't know which ones to listen to and which ones not to listen to. Mm -hmm. um, and so slowing down, like there's no hurry. So if you're having, um, pain when you're palpating, what thoughts are coming up? How are you doing emotionally? Can you breathe into it? Can you make space to feel some emotion? Because one thing really is like the connection between emotions and muscles can be pretty direct. So when you start working physically on muscles that might be contracting to hold back emotional energy, then some of that emotion is going to move, which can cause nervous system stimulation or more tension. So Right. I, I would say the same as Stephanie to fall back on listening to your body um, and sl just try slowing down. Like instead of starting with a goal in mind of inserting a dilator, maybe just rest the dilator at the opening of the vagina and breathe and relax and see how that goes and what happens if I go a little more. Um, I think with penetration in general, even when it comes to sex, we're very goal oriented and instead of working with our body we mm -hmm. have this idea of what's supposed to happen <laughs> and like yeah. it's really good like 
the vagina, the tissue in the vagina, the muscles in the pelvic floor are like alive, you know, they, things make them tense and contract and it's not so much, I mean, really like this is embarrassing to admit, but probably up until about 10 years ago, I was thinking of the vagina more as like a, like a hole that you put something in and not more like, I don't know where, it, more like a balloon that's flat, that kind of like opens when it wants to allow something in and so forcing something in uh especially if there's pain uh, is probably not a good idea but being able to work with it therapeutically like you mentioned um, agreed and most people don't know you know the vagina is like this big black box yeah and that's why i mean it really is and most people i mean you'd be surprised when we're teaching them how to use topicals and things a lot of people don't even know where their urethra is and Here's my embarrassing note. I thought until probably my early 20s that I urinated out of my vagina. I took my tampon out every time I went to the bathroom until I think one of my college roommates asked me why I was doing that because it's not pleasant if you don't need to take it out. So it's ironic that this is my job now. Right. It's great that it's it <laughs> that I thought that for like, I don't know. No, I, I thought yeah. that for like I mean, six years. <laughs> like you're so like... I appreciate you sharing that, but just like that, I mean, it oh just, my gosh. Yeah, how much, you know, culturally, we just don't talk enough about sex, vaginas, penetration, anatomy, all of that, sexual anatomy for women, especially, but also for men, but really, yeah. So yeah. A, lot, a lot of misunderstanding <laughs> out there. <laughs> Glad um, I learned. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, we just have a few more minutes left. Thank you all for sending in those questions. Um, let me see. So I have your links and your contact info, um, but if you just want to maybe mention your website or your locations or something here for people too, and I'll follow up in an email. Sure. Um, I personally see patients in our Los Angeles office. So if anyone's in Southern Cal, that's where you can find me. We are in Westlake Village, and Encinitas in Southern California, San Francisco, Los Gatos, Berkeley, and Walnut Creek in the Bay Area, Lexington, Massachusetts, and Mary Mac, New Hampshire. Our website is pelvicpainrehab.com. Um, and then I'm on Instagram and Twitter as at pelvic health. We're also on all of them, but uh, it's the easiest Instagram and Twitter is just at pelvic health. Pretty simple. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. And I will just say for the women on this call, if you're near one of those offices or near LA and you're having any kind of pelvic health issues, I highly recommend going to see Stephanie or one of the other PHRC offices. So thank you all for being here today. Stephanie, thank you so much for taking your time to be with us. Like we've done so many calls together and I learn so much every single time. So yeah. It's always good to now see you in person. I know. It's really great. Thank you to you and all the women on the call. Okay. All right. Stay safe, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye.